good morning. Happy Sabbath day. It's good to be with you today. Thank you, worship team, for leading us through those songs this morning. So beautiful and just so worshipful. I would like to begin this message in the book of Exodus, chapter 20. If you'd like to turn there with me. I'm going to give a teaching today you don't hear in a lot of churches, but definitely something that I hope that you will just see a little more and be encouraged in it today as we look at it. And I will begin with a question. What is the one commandment that, that God said... Remember, yes, Exodus 20, verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, I've, been, I've marveled my whole life that the one commandment, and, and it, I think it's not this way anymore, but a commandment that we're often told to forget is a commandment that God said to remember. It's such a, it's such a quandary, isn't it? It's like, why do we do that? But what I want us to do is think about this commandment today. I want us to go through and just kind of be reminded about it a little bit and hopefully be encouraged. Most of you might be here because you acknowledge this commandment. Maybe, maybe not. I've had people attend Rock Valley for a long time without uh, doing it, but what I want you to go through today and what I want to go through with you is just taking you through some of the verses about this commandment. But one thing I will say is if there's anybody in here that says, I'm not sure I'm supposed to keep the Sabbath day or remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, I always ask, take one challenge between you and God alone. Look up in the Bible every verse that has the word Sabbath in it and start at the beginning of the Bible and just ask, God, let me hear what you think about this and then go through from Genesis through the New Testament. And I think that's the answer that whether it's about the Sabbath or about salvation or about any teaching, doctrine, or anything in the Bible, the most important thing we can do is simply listen to what God says, ask for him to share his thought, his heart with us, and just listen, because man clouds issues. And that's why I said it's such, with the question, it, the one commandment, or at least a command we're told to forget repeatedly is a commandment God said, remember, think about, bring to your mind, remember, you only do that with, with thought. And so here's this command. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He says, six days you shall labor and do all your work. The seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who was within your gates. Why? For in six days Yahweh made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore... Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. That is, he made it holy. He made it distinct from other days. Now, turn with me back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, which is what Exodus 20 here is referring to. In Genesis chapter 1, we have the detail in regard to how God created the heavens and earth. He said he made everything. He said he made all the heavens and the earth. In chapter 2 here of Genesis, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day and all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Or again, set it apart. Because in it, he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he sanctified the seventh day? Because you can search from Genesis to Revelation. You will never find a place in all the scriptures where it said he, he reverted it to being common or being like the other six days. The only, the only scriptures that talk about whether it's sanctified or not all say it was sanctified. All of them. Check it for yourself. Don't believe me. Believe what's in the Bible. Believe what God spoke. All of them, he's, he sanctified it. But, but here's the thing about this and the placement of it in the scripture. Do you believe that as you look outside, you see those trees out there? Do you believe God made those trees? Do you believe he's responsible for the creation of it? When you look at the sun or the moon, do you believe that he actually did that? See, we look at these physical things, we say he did. What about the animals, the fish of the sea, the birds that fly? 
the peacocks that are in mating season all around my house and calling out at all time of day. I actually videotaped one because I've never actually seen them do it like in person. So if you want to see that, come, come see me later because it's like, wow, how did that, you know, that little neck make that noise? But, <laughs> but, but God made all these amazing things. And I can see that these things were created. I can see that you were created. I can understand what's in every human cell and, and, and the, the writing, the code that makes you uniquely you. You were coded. You have a code within you. It makes you who you are. You, a unique person. You and I are created, and God revealed that he created us, and we believe that. But see, at the end of the week, after he created all the things in the heavens and the earth, he created something invisible. You know, in Colossians chapter 1.16, it said that uh, Jesus made all things. Everything uh, was made by him, but he said things visible and invisible. The seventh day being sanctified is invisible. There is nothing tangible about this. By scientific method, you cannot prove that today is sanctified or holy compared to any other day that you go through. Do you know what sets it apart as sanctified and holy? Faith. Faith that God's word is true. Faith that he really did bless and sanctify the seventh day. Faith that he said, remember it and keep it holy. Faith that he did this work. See, we can look at created things and say he made those things. I will testify that he made the physical things. But when he testifies that he made a spiritual thing, something that you can't taste, smell, see, or feel, something that is only known about because of revelation from God, what makes this day different is that you believe that he made it different. That's it. So without the revelation of the word, you don't know that it's holy. Without believing what God said he did and what he did to the day, you wouldn't know that. Now, I find this one of the most beautiful beginnings to a story because in God revealing his heart, revealing his power, showing that he's the creator of all things, right away, he basically said, and here is something that only if you believe me, you will even know. Now, it is kind of an incredible thing when you think about the languages of today. You know, about 20% of the world, when they refer to the seventh day of the week, they refer to it as Sabbath, right? Lucero. En Espanol? Sabado, right? That covers a lot of the world right there. Basically, Central and South America just got covered. Spain got covered, right? Any place that they're speaking Spanish... What about if you are Martin and Simona, they're in uh, the Czech Republic today. What's the word for the seventh day? Sabbath. What if you were in the war right now in Ukraine and Russia? In both Ukrainian and Russian, what's the word for the seventh day? Sabbath. If you were in Greece, it's Sabbath. If you were speaking in Hebrew, Sabbath. Have you ever noted that? In Hebrew, in Greek, and in Aramaic, three languages used for the translation of the Bible, they all agree Sabbath means the seventh day of the week. And isn't it amazing that they all agree what the seventh day is? You can hardly get nations and different languages to agree on anything. And yet, whether you're in a Spanish-speaking country or whether you're in some of these other countries, you know what's amazing? All these different countries, and again, it covers about 20% of the earth, they all agree that the seventh day is the Sabbath. Sometimes people try to tell you it's Sabbath could be Wednesday or other days of the week. Yeah, you, you have to be an awesome conspiracy, man. Because if you're able to get multiple nations from Africa, South America, Central America, Europe, and Asia to all agree, you know, you go to Indonesia, seventh day, Sabbath. Wow, it's there too. So you can kind of travel around the world and find these things to be true. Isn't that amazing? Like, that's too good of a conspiracy. It, somehow they know that it was the seventh day. These, aren't, these weren't the children of Israel that had this in here. This is Gentile nations throughout the world that have the seventh day, all agreeing the seventh day, it's Sabbath, Sabado, Shabbat, in whatever way that their language says that word. Kind of an amazing thing. But what God is looking for is what do we do with this? 
See, just because it's known in languages in the world, just because you can read it in your Bible doesn't necessarily mean anything to us unless we have the faith to understand what it really is and what it is for us today. Turn with me over to Exodus chapter 31. Notice with me in Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31. Notice with me in verse 12. This is Yahweh speaking to Moses. And he said to speak to the children of Israel saying, Surely my Sabbath, and again this is Exodus 31, now on verse 13. Surely my Sabbath you shall keep. It is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies you. Now that's kind of cool, isn't it? A special sign. When we're told to remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, we're to remember what God did. But again, we don't have a visual way or a scientific method way to figure it out. We have to actually acknowledge him. We believe what he said he did and we live as if he did it. So when he's saying, remember this, to keep my Sabbath, it's a sign between me and you throughout your generations. It is a demonstration, actually, that you really believe he's the creator. You believe that he created things. You acknowledge that he sanctified it. Because otherwise, we're not even having this conversation. If we don't believe in the scriptures, we're not having this talk right now. If we don't believe there's a God, we're not reading the Bible. If we don't believe in the scriptures, we're not talking about the Sabbath day. What's interesting and unique about the Sabbath day is it's something that God decided to do because in the day he rested and was refreshed, he ended all his work and he said, this day will be set apart as something different. Six days we will do our work. Six days we will do our labor. Six days we'll be about our business. Six days we'll be like each other. But one day is going to be set apart as something different, something holy, and something special. And really that in itself should ask, uh, cause us to ask the question, what is it, God? Why would you do this? What I love about what God does in his word is he shares with us things that come exactly from his own heart, from his own creativity, And it's for us to listen to what he says about it so we can discover and understand his heart. The things that God commands are not random. The things that he commands are for blessing in our relationship together. And so he goes on here to say in verse 14, you shall keep the Sabbath therefore for it is holy to you. And that's the question we have to ask. Is it holy to us? Is it something distinct? Is it something special? Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. So now I want you to notice this thing about the sign. He says, it's holy to you, and it's holy to me. This is a shared thing. This is a shared part of the relationship. It's a shared part of the intimacy that we have with God. We're saying, God, I believe that this time has been sanctified by you. Why? Because you told me it was. And I want to keep it as holy. And he said, it shall be holy to you. And it is holy to me because it's holy to him. He is mine and I am his. For me to walk with the Lord, for you to walk with the Lord, we should always desire to be found present with him where he is thinking what he is thinking, doing what he's doing. Because ultimately, all of his commandments are about his character, his love, and the way he builds relationships among us all. And so he says, this is to be holy to you, but it's also holy to me, verse 15. So he says, it's holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Do you ever think about the Sabbath as being a commandment that brings about death? When you were coming to Jesus Christ and you were repenting of your sins, did you think not just about murder or stealing or lying, things that might produce death under law, but also that the Sabbath was something that produced death? The wages of sin is death. 
Not, not everything that you read about in the law has a penalty of death. But this one does. It's actually spoken here in other places. And we actually have examples, or at least example of people, a person working on the Sabbath being put to death. Do you think that God would just do that randomly or emotionally or without thought? Why would he say that this, not keeping this, is part of those commandments that produce death? See, I think that should be sobering to us enough to say, you know, I probably need to dig into this a little more. Because we live in a society that's saying, you don't need to do that. You don't need to remember. You can forget about it. You don't have to do that. And yet when you look in the scriptures, God says, yeah, this is so important to me that if you don't follow me on this, I'm going to put you to death. And I think it's worth recognizing that when God speaks of commandments that being broken can put you to death, I think we should listen to that. Because what he's saying as well is, but if you keep it, it gives you life. And that is the beautiful thing that we see in the life of Jesus Christ, was that the Sabbath is a day meant to give life. The Sabbath is a day meant to give rest. The Sabbath is a day of refreshment that is different than any other day of your week. And it is so because God made it to be there, and his instruction actually tells you how to keep it separate, how to keep it holy. So going on here, he says in verse 16, Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. And notice what he says again. It's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So just in case you're wondering how it's a sign, because it's only a sign because you believe he actually did that, that he made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. That is a witness So when you say, I believe there is such a thing as a Sabbath day that God blessed and sanctified it, what you're really saying by faith, in practice, I believe, God, that you did all that. I believe you're the creator. Because as much as I believe you made the trees, the birds of the air, the butterflies, as much as you made all the creeping things, the cattle, the fish of the sea, as much as I believe that, I believe that you made the seventh day holy. Therefore, I acknowledge your creation and I surrender myself to its intent, to why you made it. And so that's what this command is about, and that's why it's a sign between us and God forever. And so it says, and when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Now, he gave this word written with the finger of God In the first covenant, he wrote with his own finger on tablets of stone. In the new covenant, he writes with his own finger, where? On the tablets of our hearts. So what we need to understand is this was not a commandment just to be in stone. This is a commandment that God writes on the tablets of our hearts that we need to understand and have comprehension of, that we need to be entering into the beauty of what God made here for us and really seeing it as he intended it to be for us. Turn with me over to Ezekiel, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 20. Because the record of the Israelites receiving these commandments and keeping them was not that good. It was something that was rejected. And frankly, it's something rejected even by the people of God today to say, hey, you don't need to worry about this, just forget about it. But I want you to see why we humanly want to forget about it. Notice here with me, if you would, in Ezekiel chapter 20. I mean, Ezekiel chapter 20, I'm going to begin in verse 11. In Ezekiel 20, verse 11, and so this is basically God saying, you know, I brought you out, I gave you freedom, but you just want to go right back to the way it was before. And you might remember, do you, do you remember the first law that God gave the children of Israel when he brought them out of Egypt? He, he, he grabs them out of bondage where they had been slaves, And then he brings them into the wilderness, and the first thing he says is, I'm going to test them to see if they're going to keep my law or not. And he does it with the Sabbath. He starts raining manna day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. Day six, he rains twice as much. And on the Sabbath, nothing. 
I want you to just think, think if you were living in that time and he did that every week for 40 years, do you think you would see it as significant? I'm going to say that we probably would. That would have some significance, right? And what happened? If they tried to store over two days worth when they collected on Monday, what would happen? It, yes, it would rot. It would stink. Worms were in it, right? But miraculously, when he rained it on on uh, the sixth day of the week, they collected twice as much. It was good for them. It was also good for the seventh day. It sustained them all the way to the first day. No rot, no stink, no worms. I think it's pretty dramatic. And you know what happened? Even though he said this is the way it's going to be, somebody went out looking for it. And he's like, what's wrong with you guys? Don't you see what I did for you? Why are you looking? I told you, don't go looking on that day. It's not a day to be doing your work. I'm going to have you work six days a week, and on the seventh, you get to rest. You're not a slave anymore. It's okay to rest. You don't have to be in the rat race all the time. And so, what happens, though? In verse 11 here of Ezekiel 20, he said, I gave them my stab, uh, statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies them. Yet the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes. They despised my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. And they greatly defiled my Sabbaths. Then I said to them, I'll pour out my fury in the wilderness and consume them. But I acted for my name's sake, that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles in whose sight I had brought them out. So I raised my hand and an oath to them in the wilderness that I would not bring them into the land which I had given them flowing with milk and honey, the glory of the lands. So everything God wanted to bless them with, they rejected him in the wilderness. Not, not good. And they rejected him even after he brought him into the promised land. But he said, you know what? I'm going to have mercy even though they're not doing what I said. You need to do this. God still had mercy on them, and praise God that he has mercy on all of us for when we break the Sabbath or break any of his commandments. But it doesn't mean we set out with an intention to do that. And so he said, I raised my hand in oath, verse 15, to them, that I would not bring them into the land which I had given, flown with milk and honey, the glory of all lands. Why not, God? Why did you not do that? He said, because they despised my judgments and did not walk in my statutes, but profaned my Sabbaths, for their heart went after their idols. You know, most of the time when this subject comes up, the thing that we battle is not so much the word of God. The thing we battle is what's going on in our own hearts. We don't want to do it. We think it's restrictive. We think that God is somehow prohibiting liberty and freedom when actually what he's trying to do is give us liberty and freedom. The whole purpose of the day is a day of celebration of liberty and freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. It is a day of enjoyment. It is a day of delight. It's a day of delighting in God, as I'll show. And we miss it because what we're thinking about is I don't get to do what I want to do. It's amazing how many idols we can pursue in this world that rob us of our identity that is found in God who made us and who tell us little lies that they are the real enjoyment that will give us peace and rest and they always fall short. Parties, drunkenness, doing drugs, being vain in life, just hanging out, doing nothing, with, with, without understanding where real rest comes from. They don't satisfy. You know, and what we find is that the more we engage in behaviors of this world that are vain, the more you realize, and you just start to get sick of it after a while, right? How many of you have been there with me? You just... You just start to get sick of it. You're like, it doesn't satisfy. It doesn't give me rest. It doesn't really bring me back to where I need to be. And God is saying, this is a sign between me and you. We're connecting right now. And see, as you come here today, as you sanctify this day as holy, and you say it's holy, I'm coming to worship the Lord on this day. I'm acknowledging him as creator. I'm acknowledging we have something here. He's saying, this is something between us whereby we connect, whereby we're going to engage with one another 
And you're not going to go after your other idols. All the things that want your attention. He's like, I want you to set those aside. Because this is what our purpose is today. Notice in the book of Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. In Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 13, it says, If you will turn your foot, away your foot from the Sabbath. In other words, don't trample on it and treat it like it's a common thing. Think of it as being a special thing. If you think of it as holy, as sanctified, as set apart, if you will do that, and from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, And shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. Now, there's a lot of questions about these verses, and it's kind of interesting if you go back and look at some of the translations of how this first was put into English back in the 1500s. It looks a lot different than it does here in the New King James today. Because what often happens is we start to read this and we say, wait a second, you can't find your own pleasure, you can't speak your own words, does that mean I can't talk? Does that, and literally I've read articles about this, so that's why I'm bringing it up. I can't talk, I can't enjoy the day, I can't have any pleasure, this can't be a pleasing day. That's not what it's talking about. What it's talking about is doing your own will, not doing things that please you. In other words, that are your will to do. God's not saying don't enjoy the Sabbath. What he's saying is don't be about looking to do your own will on things that please you. Don't be doing things that are of your own thoughts and own mind, things that you would speak that come from you. But rather, what he says here is, look, call the Sabbath a delight. In other words, (laughs) take pleasure in it. Enjoy it. It's a day off of work. You don't have to go about the normal business. He says, I will provide so that you can have time off. This is something to enjoy and take pleasure in. In fact, that word delight, it's like thinking of it, one of the words that's used for it in English is exquisite. Like you just think it's a beautiful, wonderful, lovely thing. The Sabbath, is it exquisite? And think about the enjoyment that God wants you to have that he's saying, look, this day is for us. This day is a day you don't have to go about your regular labor and go about your regular work. And he says, not only that, call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of Yahweh honorable. And we've already read that, right? He sanctified it. This comes from his mind, not man's. God made it. And he's saying this is his day. So call it his day. This is a day that he made to be holy and blessed. Call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of Yahweh, honorable, and notice, and honor him. Now, if I can teach you just one thing about how to keep the Sabbath, it's this. If you will set your attention, not in going to your work or your job, not not going about that, but just set your attention and saying, you know what I'm going to do every Sabbath? I'm going to delight in it and I'm going to honor God in it. If you do that, I assure you'll be keeping the Sabbath in a very beautiful way. When you think about it, do you set your mind to honor him? And is that the intention by which you go about keeping it? Because it can turn into a lot of different things. But ultimately, what should be your driving thought? Honoring him. That's a hard issue. That's a principal issue. And in that you get to make determinations about what that looks like to you. And you know what? That's kind of the way God did it. He made it based on principles. Man creates a bunch of do's and don'ts for the Sabbath, but God spoke of it in principles. Why? Because it's to be a day of liberty. It's a day of experiencing rest and giving rest. It's to be a day of mercy. To remember, as it says in Deuteronomy 5, it's, we, we celebrate it remembering that we were slaves and he brought us to freedom. We remember him and we observe the thing that he made for us. Turn back with me to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah happened after the time that both 
Israel and Judah were brought into captivity. And one of the reasons, as we read in Ezekiel 20, but it's also in other places, one of the reasons God brought them into captivity was they just wouldn't keep his commandments. They wouldn't worship him. They, they ended up worshiping other gods that brought him in all kind of depravity. So here is Nehemiah. After he'd gone back from the captivity, he's back in Jerusalem. He's helping to build the wall to restore Jerusalem to what it became and what it still was in existence in the time of Jesus. Here he comes back, and notice in Nehemiah 13, so after they had built the wall, after they had society running again, the Israelites were there uh, dwelling, and the, and the children, excuse me, the families there uh, from uh, Babylon had come back. And notice what he says here in Leviticus chapter 13. Or excuse me, Nehemiah chapter 13. I'm so sorry. Nehemiah chapter 13. And notice here in verse 14, he says in this prayer to God, Remember me, O my God concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for its services. In those days, I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath, bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys with wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. Now, is that basically what we were told not to do in Exodus chapter 20? He said, don't Don't work. Exodus 31, you shouldn't be working on this day. So you wouldn't be doing your business. You wouldn't be doing that. So, and again, in Isaiah, not doing what pleases you, not doing your own will and work, but rather you're supposed to be honoring God. And God said, you're supposed to keep the Sabbath even in harvest time. And if you've ever grown up around farmers, I've I've never been a farmer, but I've grown up around farmers. It's like that could mean a lot to them to be able to harvest on the Sabbath, or in plowing time to plow on the Sabbath. To miss that day, you know, logically, human, rationale, I might need that day, but God says, don't do it. Don't do it. My mom tells me a story about a family who believed in keeping the Sabbath um, in a, in a farm where she grew up back in uh, northern Illinois, right on the Indiana border, and... Um, there was a guy who needed to get his, his uh, land plowed and planted, uh, but it had been such a rainy spring, he was having difficulty do it, to do it. And one of the first great days he had to do it was on the day, the Sabbath. And he decided not to do it, and his neighbors were like, what is wrong with you? You should be working and not honoring God. And he decided to honor God. And she said she will never forget it because, one, she saw him being chastened and rebuked by other farmers. And, two, because a couple months later in the middle of summer, there was a huge hailstorm and his crop wasn't touched. But around him, his neighbor's crops got really badly damaged by the hail. And she said she just remembered that somebody showed faith in God and did something to honor God, and he was rebuked for it. But his crop not only was preserved, but it became more valuable. So kind of a cool story of remembrance. And Nehemiah is saying, God, remember me, because I saw them. I warned them about this day. Verse 16, men of Tyre dwelt there also who brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, what evil thing is this that you do by which you profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers do thus, and did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? In other words, don't you guys remember why we went into bondage in the first place? Here we finally are back to Jerusalem, and what's going on? Here we are, right back to what we did before. He said, yet you bring added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath, verse 18. So it was at the gates of Jerusalem, as it began to be dark before the Sabbath, And if anybody has a question about when the Sabbath begins, that kind of gives you a clue, right? At sunset. That I commanded the gates to be shut and charged that they must not be opened until after the Sabbath. And I posted some of my servants at the gate so no burdens would be brought in on the Sabbath day. Now the merchants and sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. And I warned them and said to them, why do you spend the night around the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. Now he wasn't talking about the New Testament way. This was, the, this was a, a different kind of laying on of hands right here. 
he was, he was not going to be happy, and they, they wouldn't like that either. There's no nice oil on that. It's just a different kind of laying on of hands. And he said, from that time on, they came no more on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves. They should go and guard the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of your mercy. So his prayer to God was saying, remember that I protected your commandment. Remember that I did this for, the, for your people here at Jerusalem. And it appears, as we can read through history, this began a time of, of Sabbath observance and it continued on to the time that we read about Jesus coming on the scene, right? And, and there he was coming on the scene for his ministry and there was a temple there and there was Sabbath observance there. It was still going on to that point in time. But I also want us to notice what it started to look like. Turn with me over to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. So here is Jesus in Jerusalem, a place that was being sanctified for the remembrance of God and and the Sabbath day to have work cease. And now notice here in Matthew chapter 12, verse 1, at that time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain to eat it. Now, you might remember uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 24 to 25, it says this. If you are walking through your neighbor's vineyard and basically you're hungry, you can eat grapes. You can eat the grapes. You just can't put them in a container and take them away. But you can eat there. So no doggy bag. But if you're hungry... You can eat the grapes, but you can't basically take from your neighbor because that's kind of where it goes to stealing, right? But if you're hungry, God says do it. Same thing with the grain fields. He said if you're going through a grain field and you're hungry, you can take with your hand and eat. Just don't start putting it into a container that you're going to remove from the property. If you're hungry, eat, but you're not there to grab your neighbor's food, right? And that's kind of a good rule of hospitality that God put into his law. So if somebody's hungry and there's food right there, eat it. He made it. He's the one that actually gave the increase of it. So he's saying that you have the right to eat it. So they weren't stealing here. They weren't doing anything wrong in that regard. But what were they doing in the eyes of those who were watching? Working. It says you shall do no work. Right? We read that in Exodus 20. We read it again in Exodus 31. Here they are working. And notice they call it out. So when the Pharisees, verse 2, saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. I want you to see something. Jesus never argued that point. He never argued it. He argued the higher law. He argued the higher law. Watch this. Jesus said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. You see, if we go and look at the law of God that he gave in regard to Aaron and his sons back in Leviticus chapter 24, it says it's holy for Levite and his sons. And it's so holy, they had to actually eat it in a holy place. And it is holy for the priests. David's not a priest. David's not even of the tribe of Levi. But David was given bread by the priests and he ate it. Every Saturday, every Sabbath, that bread was exchanged. It was in the temple and then they ate it. Why is Jesus telling us this? Was it that he considered that a good thing? that David did an unlawful thing, that the priest gave him what was not lawful for him to have? He's arguing a higher law. And this is where most of us get tripped up in our observance of the Sabbath, that we get down to a specific point of the law in its practice and not take into consideration the higher law. The Sabbath is not filled with a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's filled with basic principles. And if we don't understand that, our observance of it will become very legalistic 
And we will be looking at what other people do and say, you profane the Sabbath. You broke the Sabbath because you did this. You might not know all the reasons. And by the way, why is that your job? Ultimately, the Sabbath is to be a sign between us and God. So I would like to put your attention on the relationship that you have with God in the way that you observe the Sabbath and not to use it as a form of any judgment against a brother at all. It's not your job. See, the relationship that we have in connectedness of this is to God. Now, if somebody's openly doing something in a proudful way or openly rejecting, that's different. But you can't always know what's going on in someone's heart. And look at what Jesus said. He said in verse 5, have you not read in the law on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? He's actually saying they profane it. How do they profane it in the law? Working, yes. They physically were working to do circumcisions on the Sabbath. That, that's, that's a medical procedure, right? You have to set that up. They were doing sacrifices. Has anybody ever rendered an animal? I, I've never done it because it looks like too much work. I have my limits. Six days work, but let somebody else do the butchering. That's, that's kind of the Liesenfeld rule. Let somebody else do that work. It's hard work to render an animal. They were doing that every Sabbath. Jesus is saying, have you not read in the law on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath? He's saying that they're not doing it. Why, why were they doing that? Though? Why were they allowed to work? Right? Glorifying God. They were honoring God. There was a higher law that was superseding the specific about thou shalt not work. And this is the reality that I want to teach you, is that you have to be able to look at things, not just in the letter, but in the spirit of the law, to understand and make decisions. And guess who gets to make the decision? You before God. You before God. I cannot judge the way you do it. You can't really judge the way I do it, because ultimately, there's a heart and intent that is going on that you might not understand. So what would be the point to be on the wrong side of judgment like these Pharisees? Do you think they were in a good spot here? I'm thinking this is not cool. Because basically what they're doing is calling out Jesus and his disciples saying, you're breaking the law. And Jesus didn't even say, well, he basically said, yeah, it kind of looks like it. We're working, aren't we? But to the higher law, <laughs> they, they, weren't even, they weren't even breaking the Sabbath at all. Notice what Jesus says. Verse 6, Yet I say to you in this place, there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now this is important to understand the difference between keeping the Sabbath with the heart and intent as a sign between you and Almighty God of what he's created and making it your religion. I remember uh, before we moved into this facility, when we still run it over at Bread of Life, there was a, a young man with his wife, and they had a, a very young child. And they traveled up from uh, over an hour away to come to, to keep... Uh, the Sabbath with us and worship with us on the Sabbath. Well, we, we had morning services just like we do now, 1030. And it was in the summertime, so a lot of daylight left. And they were staying talking with people, and pretty much everybody left. And they realized they didn't have enough gas even to get back home. But he's like, I can't go buy gas to get back home. But everybody from the church had left. We didn't really have connections. Like It wasn't like he could have called me or anything like that. We hadn't shared information. But I found out the next week that rather than buying the gas, which he had the money to buy gas and go home, he didn't. But his wife and, and his little child was hungry. They were hungry. And the Sabbath didn't end until, I don't know, 7.30, 8 o'clock that evening. He made his family sit and wait for hours for the Sabbath to end because he didn't want to go buy food or gas. Now, 
do you think that a higher law might have come into place there? The weightier matters of the law are justice, mercy, and faith. I plead with you to consider this in the way that you judge in your Sabbath observance if you are taking into consideration justice, mercy, faith, and I'll add what Luke says, love, as weightier matters of the law. Because if your observance of a law causes you to be unmerciful and unjust to feed those who are hungry, who are under your provision and care, if we can't see things like that, we are reading the Old Testament with a veil over our eyes that is making us religious and self-righteous and not fulfilling the law in the heart and intent that God has for us to do it. We are appreciating the sacrifice, that is, make the animal sacrifice, but not the heart behind the sacrifice. Remember, that's what Jesus is talking about. Jesus, when he was quoting the scripture, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Oh, you're so good at following the rules. Oh, yeah, you're, you're killing the animal, but what's in your heart? If the heart's not right, if you don't understand the purpose of the law and the commandments, and it doesn't have to do with justice, mercy, faith, and love, you are missing the law of God. You're missing his heart in it. This is supposed to be a day of liberty. Remember even in the commandments, what did he say? In it you shall do no work. You nor your sons, your daughters, your manservants, your maidservants. Are you actually giving rest? Are you giving relief? Are you giving mercy? This is what Jesus shows. Jesus butted heads with Pharisees, lawyers in the Gospels over the Sabbath because they were so tied to the religious, thou shalt not, this is the law, this is the rule, they missed the whole law. And he said, you're, you're missing this. You're missing the whole thing. And in fact, if you will do a study of the Sabbath through the Gospels, you'll find it's one of the most uh, occupied times of teaching about how to keep the law, it, one of God's commandments. God actually spends a lot of time showing you what was going on so that you and I could keep it correctly, that we could enter in with the rest that it really is about and, and not be legalistic about it. So notice he goes on here to say, so when he departed there, verse 9, he went into the synagogue, and behold, there was a man who had a withered hand, and they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath that they might accuse him? They wanted to accuse him of something. What? Of saying it's okay? And Jesus said, what man is there among you who has one sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath and will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? We would do it for an animal, but not a human. Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. You can be helpful on the Sabbath. In fact, it's lawful. Do you get that? I mean, it's not just, it's not just like neutral. It's lawful. It's full of the law. It's, it's the essence of what it would be. In fact, this day is a beautiful day for you to spend time doing things that your common work day week doesn't allow for. It's a beautiful time to go visit somebody who's sick, who's maybe suffering at home. Maybe they're in a hospital. It's a beautiful time to write a letter to somebody of encouragement, to give some thanks or appreciation to people that are a blessing in your life. It's a beautiful time to think about honoring God and being a blessing to those that God has created. It's not a day of inactivity. It's not a day of idleness. And what so often happens is, and, 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 and young parents, I'll, I'll just say this from my own experience, focus on honoring God and not so much on what you can't do. I think, it, I think that it, it turns our children to a letter of the law of observance where you say, well, well, you can't do that, and you can't do this, and you can't do that, and you make the Sabbath what you can't do. It's really simple to say, here's what, here's what we're going to do, right? We're going to spend some family time together. We're going to go to the, well, we used to call it nursing home, uh, assisted care facilities. We're going to go to the assisted care facilities because there's people in there. Do you ever stop to think about the people that are in the facilities that never get visited? See, I, I had a, a grandmother and a mother, and, and Stephanie and I, that's where our ministry began, basically, in Illinois, was going into uh, senior centers. Because you go in and you find out 
this person has no one come to see them. This person has no one come to see them. This person has no one come to see them. What is pure and undefiled religion? To visit the widow, right, and the fatherless in their affliction. What would it be like for you if you were stuck in a home and nobody came to see you but you can't leave? It kind of stink, wouldn't it? Do you realize you can be a difference maker in that? You can go and spend time with them, talk to them, share books with them, play games with them. You can actually just make their day a little better. You know what? It doesn't even take that much time. It's a beautiful activity. The Sabbath, and this is what Jesus kind of went around doing. I don't know if he ever played games or Uno or anything like that, but he definitely was, he definitely was engaged with people. He wasn't closing himself off from the ministry that he was doing. So here he, had, he stretched out the hand, and what did they want to do? They wanted to destroy him. Turn over with me to Mark chapter 2, verse 27. Mark chapter 2, verse 27. He said to them, the Sabbath was made for man. Who was it made for? Man. So when God made it, he was thinking about you. That's the purpose in making it. The Sabbath was made for man. But man was not made for the Sabbath. In other words, you weren't made to keep the rules of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was meant to be a gift for you. It's supposed to be a blessing in your life to connect you to God and, and, and have a relationship with him in it, to be spending time delighting in it, having joy in it, seeing it as something special, seeing it as something holy, seeing it something to delight in the honorable day of God, and, and to honor him. Now, if you think about honoring God, you're going you're gonna to be basically on your way to keeping the Sabbath in a very positive, proactive way. And realize that's what all of the law is. You can't love somebody unless you actually care about them. You can't do good unless you're thinking about how it is that I can do good. You have to be observant. You have to be noticing. You have to take action. So the Sabbath is not a day of idleness. The Sabbath is a day of engagement with God and with others to do this. But he also says here, therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. So remember that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. He made it for us, and we weren't made for it. Sometimes we keep it like we were made for it. And we need to be acknowledging we weren't made for it. It was made for us to be a blessing apart from work, apart from profane, apart from what's common. So are you enjoying it? Are you looking at it as something that's a burden? Or are you looking at it as something as a delight? For this is the love of God that we would keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. If we're thinking of it as a burden, then just look at what's going on. Why would it be a burden? Because you feel you're missing out on doing something that maybe you want to do. But what if you just looked at it as what God wants me to do? That is to honor him, to bless him, and to be engaged in being a blessing to others. To say, you don't have to work this day. This is a day to take true rest. Because the rest that the Sabbath gives, if it's just an idleness you'll never really experience what it's supposed to be. But if it's by faith in him and you draw near to him in honoring him, I assure you, you'll find true rest. The rest really is found in Jesus. And we come to find it when we go to the Lord of the Sabbath and we see the Sabbath as that blessing that comes from him. Turn with me over to John chapter 5. In John 5, verses 5 to 18, it says this, John 5, verses 5 to 18, it says, There was a certain man there who had an infirmity for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? And the sick man answered and said, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool of water that is stirred up, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. It's like, I don't need to put you in the water. I'm just going to heal you right here and now. Woo, go God. Go Jesus. So... I just did a Scott right there. Do you see how he's rubbed off on me over the years? That was a total Scott. I just channeled Scott. So, rise, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, 
took up his bed and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews that said to him who was cured, it's the Sabbath day. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. Now, when the Son of Man heals you and says, "Take, rise up, after 38 years of laying down all the time, and says, take up your bed and walk, you do it, right? Was Jesus telling him to break the Sabbath? So, see, now, this depends where you fall on that, right? Was it? Was he carrying a burden? It says you should carry no burden on the Sabbath. He's, he's walking with his bed. I mean, he's kind of doing a moving job there. So you, you, you go down this road. When they're looking, they're saying, you're moving on the Sabbath. See, to their eyes, he's doing something he shouldn't be doing. That's why I said it... it, it it can, it can lead you down a lot of foolish roads to start judging people. If you want to encourage people to keep the Sabbath and how to keep it according to God's word, go for it. But you just don't know the decisions that they're making in their heart and why they're doing it. And this person was following Jesus, and here he is being accused as a, as a lawbreaker when what was really being manifested was a beautiful observance of the Sabbath. A man was healed. That's a higher law. That's, that's like the purpose of Sabbath, mercy, healing, justice, righteousness. And so here he is being accused, and they said to him, it's not lawful, verse 10, 11, he answered them and said, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, who is the man who said this to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know it was uh, who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. And afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. And the man departed and told the Jews it was Jesus who had made him well. And for this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. They did not like that Jesus was working on the Sabbath. Notice over in John chapter 6, Jesus was asked, In verse 28, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to him, this is the work of God that you would believe on him whom he sent. This was the work for which he was called to do, to work the works of God. And he says again, I have been working and my father has been working. Even until now, we have been working My memory went shot right there. All right. You guys know that verse. Somebody have it as a memory verse? Oh, come on. Help me. Help me, congregation. All right. I'm going to leave it go. In the book of John, you will find that Jesus said, I have been working and my father had been working when he was accused of breaking the Sabbath by working. Because the work of God doesn't end, and the work of God is to build faith, and the work of God is to glorify God, and the work of God is to honor him. So on the Sabbath, that is what we do. We honor God, and we give him glory, and if there's work involved in it, we do it. So if you're driving home today, and you find somebody that's pulled off on the side of the road and looks to be having difficulty, you don't say, I can't stop to help, because that might be working Somebody else will take care of it. And you know, there are things in life that you're going to encounter when you are honoring God on the Sabbath that you have to make the judgments, what's the higher law? I actually tend to think, in my experience of keeping the Sabbath for, for many years now, that God kept a lot of it based on principle just so he could see if we would learn how to judge according to principle instead of specifics. Because you have to think, you have to engage, you have to ask, you have to discern, you have to be led by the Spirit to understand how you do certain things. And see, what we're talking about on the Sabbath is the same thing that saved Rahab and her whole family. She broke the law to save her family. She broke the law, and it's accounted as faithful and righteous in the Scriptures. But she bore false witness, no doubt about that. We could all read it. 
She bore false witness, and yet it's accounted as righteousness. Why? Because of a higher law. My friends, my encouragement to you is not just about the Sabbath today, but about the law in general. But as we keep it, we have to see higher law. And if we don't see higher law, we'll be stuck in letter of the law that may not go far enough to what it is. So as you think about the Sabbath and you think about your own keeping of it and remembering this commandment, I would ask you to think about where it came from. It came from God's heart. I would ask you to remember what he did. He rested and was refreshed, and he sanctified it so you could be rested and refreshed. That you would think about it not just as a day of idleness or what you can't do, but you would see it as a day, truly that it is, a connection between you and God, a day to honor him. And not only to take rest for yourself, but in taking your rest to give rest to others, to give blessing to others, to share the word of Jesus Christ with one another, and to do things that build up and edify to the glory of God. These are just some of the things that God gave us a Sabbath for. And we hope that you'll keep thinking about it, that you'll be encouraged to enter into it more, and it will create a deeper intimacy with you and our Father in heaven. Let's praise him.